Welcome to the Science of Fishing, where we deliver the latest reports and most up-to-date tactics to help you catch more fish. Each episode, we'll get into what's biting and break down exactly what you need to do to get out there and catch them up. Special thanks to Black Reef Spearfishing for sponsoring this podcast. Now, here's your host, Mark Farrar. What's going on, everybody? I'm here with Captain R.J. Boyle. He's the owner of R.J. Boyle Studios at a Lighthouse Point. This man has decades of fishing experience off the waters of South Florida and beyond. He innovated daytime sword fishing. Something you guys didn't know about R.J. maybe is that he could throw a 90 mile per hour fastball back in the day. He used to have cutting edge alternative music artists play out of his dive bar. He used to reel 200 pound sword fishing every day. He still does do that on occasion. And he does exquisite artwork out of his studio, depicting all his catches and other people's catches that they want. What's going on, Cap? How you doing today? I'm doing great, man. I'm doing great. It was a long day, a lot of sword paintings today and uh, fishing yesterday. And you shorted me on the fastball. I threw over 90, 92, 93, sometimes 94 when I was on. But the truth is, I couldn't tell you where I was going. I could throw it really hard, but I had no good control, you know? Um, <laughs> Yeah, no, there was guys. Once you got up into the minor leagues, I was just a regular Joe. I wasn't good enough to stay, but that was that was a fun time. And uh, things are going well, man, I'll tell you. You know, we're so blessed with what we do. And, you know, fortunately for us, man, we're gifted to do different things all the time. So we're one day we're fishing, like you said, and the next day we're making films for the crew platform, our informative, um, you know, platform and you know then we're rigging bait one day we're you know so we're always doing something different so we keep it keep it exciting so things are good man I, I, to say the least man i love to hear that i love to hear that you know you have an exquisite resume as i said already you are the pioneer of daytime sword fishing pretty much you know i wouldn't say so let's stop with there let's just clarify just for the for the people so we know when you say that what that means you know so Truly, right. for me, right? So I say, I say, man, if it wasn't for the Stanzix, I wouldn't be doing any of the stuff that I'm doing. And that's a true statement. And, you know, Vic Gaspany and Richard Stanzik and Scott down in the Keys and Nick, those were the guys, if they would have never caught that 50 pounder that they caught on their first drop while trying to catch one of the day, I don't know if any of us would be doing what we're doing. So the fact is, I'm gonna, I give them full credit for all the successes and things that we're doing today. Now, from the technique and the tackle and all of the, the experimenting, yeah, I, I, I will say that we, we're, 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 we, can, we can hold that. I, I, that's something we spent so much time in. And truth be told, fortunately in sword fishing, you know, I, you, foot, you know, you have friendships with people and I'll never forget how it went down. And I can tell it now after all these years, if you want to hear kind of how it happened. Absolutely. Please tell us. So, so this was interesting. So, you know, obviously we fished at night, you know, back in the day we were fishing at night for 15 years, you know, going out in the afternoon, catching live bait and runners and squids and fishing all night and coming in at three, four, five in the morning. Man, and I was on, you know, the boat I fished on back then was called the Bill Collector, but it's the boat I own today. So I've been fishing on the boat that I own now for, gosh, over 30 years, right? So all of those night catches and all that abnormal lifestyle of trying to work and fish and get up and maintain a relationship with my wife and, you know, without being edgy from fishing, Man, those, that was the beginning of, you know, that that recreational swordfish boom at night was so special, man. And, you know, now that, and then when, you know, after 15 years or so of that type of fishing, you know, the guy at Great Taxidermy says to me, um, one of the owners, Ian Hall, he says, hey, man, and, and Ian loved fishing. He still loves fishing, but... He, he was always working. He's a big hunter. Ian Hall's a great guy. He has a boat called Stuff It, like stuff him out. So 
in our nighttime sword fishery, Ian said to me one day, hey, man, we, we really, I'd really love to fish with you guys. And so we helped Ian out at night, you know, setting up rods, how to fish it, how to react to bites, how to do it. And so after years of, of him having success, too, one day I get a call from me and he says, hey, RJ, you need to get down here to Great Taxidermy. I said, OK, I'll be down in a little while. And he takes me into his office and he says, hey, man, close the door behind you. And it was like we were the drug deal was about to go down, and I, and it was like it was felt it felt really awkward. Like, did I do something bad? Or now I'm closing the door, and he's kind of looking out the office because they have clear windows there. And it, he says, "Just sit down. I need to show you something." So I sit down. And he he takes a picture out of the desk and he, he pushes it over towards me. And it's a picture of him laying next to a swordfish, right? But the sun's up. And I'm like, that's a really nice sword. Great, great catch. I mean, listen, we all fought fish into the night. Okay, we you worked at you, but nothing really clicked. He goes, are you looking at the picture? I, yeah, it looks like a three or 400 pounder. It's a nice fish. He's a smaller guy, but this fish was big and it was fat. And he goes, no, look close at the picture. Long story short, he says, it's daytime. And I caught it right out here on monofilament line. I dropped down on the first drop. We caught this fish. But the guys in the Keys, Nick, had had spoken to him. And he kept it secret for quite some time and went out and tried it the first time he ever dropped off of Fort Lauderdale. He caught a 350-pound sword. So the cat was kind of out of the bag to me. Now, the guys in the Keys weren't saying anything still. So I never said anything. So... The, the only person I told at that point was John Anderson, I believe, from um, A Boat Called Off the Wall. And John had free time, I think, either the next day or the day after that. And he went fishing, and, he, and this first drop, he sent me a picture of a swordfish. And from that day on, it was, and, and to be honest with you, it was back, gosh, before the, right around the recession times, and, you know, I wasn't making enough money at the, the shop to sustain it. And I started going every day and I, I leased a, a swordfish permit and I went every single day. And I, I'm, I'm just, I was getting swordfish bites. I thought they were snapper pecks. I had no idea that a little peck on the rod was a swordfish. Who would think that was a swordfish? So honestly, the, the beginning, that's how it really started to trickle. Those boys were doing it. He he told Ian at Great Taxidermy, who told me, who told I told one other guy, and then it was quiet. I'd go fishing. There was no one fishing for swordfish, zero. You'd go to the sword grounds. I was the only one on the swordfish grounds. So it was so interesting in the beginning to see it start that way and the failure that I had with tackle and, and hooking them. I couldn't hook anything. I didn't understand how to manipulate a fish or drop back. I didn't even know I was getting swordfish bites. So... We go from 200 pound braid to on LPs, which I was the first one to basically use the LP for sword fishing. And then we'd snap fish off because I was using the wrong roller tip and my braid was getting caught in the guide and it would snap off if I got a fish on. So that's what we went to the Winthrop top and, and the design of the sword fish rod and, and the wind on leader. The, you know, I miss so many fish. Some of the older guys will remember that my initial swordfish rig was called the Christmas tree rig. And it was a big chicken rig. And it was a 75 foot leaders hanging off of a main line with a lead at the bottom. So if you missed them on the first one, maybe you'd snag them on the second one. So there was a lot of technical technique going on. And for years and years and years and a lot of investment and time, money, effort, energy that went towards fine tuning the tackle and the technique. So... They caught him in the modern day area, era in Stanzik and Vic Gaspany, Scott and, and uh, Nick. Technically, yeah, I would say I, I, we'll take some credit for the rest of it. That's incredible. Wow. So just started off with just someone telling someone else and then it just you kind of made it click and you tried it all to get it going, huh? We did. We, we, we tried everything. We lost a lot. We, we lost fish. We hooked fish. I, honestly, I, I, I want to say one of the first fish, one of the first fish I, I, I cried the first fish I caught the day. It was so, it was so fabulous. And I had no idea that it was a sword because it, because I wasn't used to the, 
the little peck on the rod and I was I was upset and then I finally snagged one I think and when it came up it was just it was so overwhelming to do it and I knew at that point we started to figure out what a sword bite looked like and and so yeah you know thinking back on how it was and you know there was no one out there so if you think about that now after all the years 16 or 17 years that we've been doing it in the day to snap my fingers and remember a where I was fishing was nowhere near where we fish now and I was getting bites all the time it's like the transition of what we do you know some guys sometimes the human element comes into play and you say well we need to move offshore further off the rocks we used to fit why would i drop anywhere other than the 50 line because at night we fished on the 50. so the 50 was 1200 feet 1100 feet 1050 feet it was shallow got plenty of bites caught plenty of fish lost a lot of tackle so over time we moved out to the 48 several miles offshore where we were catching them so it's interesting to see now, you know, you still have naysayers and you always have haters and you always have, I mean, that's the nature of the human, you know, so if somebody's successful at doing something, you're always going to have people that don't like them, you know, and in, and in the truth, people, most people that do that kind of stuff are uneducated to a point where they don't get it. So, you know, you'd hear, oh, the swordfish are extinct and you guys are killing all the big ones and, it, you know, that, without being educated. So that's just part of it. So Truthfully, we, we over the last few years have just one of our fun things is to educate people on really what's happening, not just with swordfish, but with everything that we do, you know, in fishing. You know, I was doing a film today of talking about wind on leaders and the construction of them. And, you know, what what the cool thing is having a tackle store that's we have an elitist technical tackle shop because of the guys that work there because of our abilities. And so what happens is. You know, we have a customer that has a huge passion for learning, but you still feel the failure on a daily basis. I went out, I've had this wind on part, I bought it down the street somewhere. And you see, not, not that we're perfect by any means, okay? And we, we make mistakes, but, but the truth is the fundamentals of big game tackle and the cost to do what we're doing is, is a lot. Um, you still got me? Yep. Um, and, and so... It's important to me to, to teach fundamental fishing. And if there's products on the market or there's things being constructed like wine dons that are that would cost you a fish of a lifetime because a person's just trying to cut corners um, in the assembly process of the way things are. That's why our crew platform is so there's no advertising in it. We take we take and look at all the different tackle products that are out there. And if we feel you have a, a good product, and we're going to say that I, I think this is a good product. If it's if it's something that we test and it's not really a good product, I would say it's probably not shouldn't be your first choice. But that's that's fairness. We're not swayed by sponsorship. We don't need any of that. We've been fishing long enough to do what we do, and we're kind of in with the guys that are good fishermen and, and and that are willing to help us. And so we're all learning and sharing and doing that. So to me. It's awesome, man. I, I, you know, I love the learning. I love the fishing. Obviously, the artwork and the other stuff is an element and a spoke on the wheel of what we do for the brand, you know? Right, right. I just love that. I love that you break it down. You know, you say it's educational and everything. That's the whole premise of this show. It's supposed to be an educational show. The science of fishing. You have mastered the science of sword fishing. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, question for you, kind of for the novice, can you explain for someone that's trying to get into sword fishing, you know, what exactly it entails? What are the basics of it? Well, and I, know, I know it's complicated, but. Well, here's what I would tell you to make it simple for you. If you were somebody that was interested in going out, and I could say this even from the days of night fishing, doing charters my whole life as a mate and or a captain, never spend a dollar sword fishing until you're ready to go out and charter somebody who is pretty good at it to really even figure out if you like it. Cause the truth be told daytime sword fishing is one of the most boring things that you can do. And I would say 50% of people can't stand it because the element of looking at what a rod tip, 
and oh, oh, we're looking at the buoy. Thank God for the buoy nowadays, because almost the, yeah, we've got this Jaws effect out there. What happens when the buoy goes under? So you have this added interest. Remember, for years we fished one rod, and you had six guys on a boat staring at one rod tip, and, and they're going, you know, and most people have the, the attention span for a very short time. So, you know, then you'd have the heckler. Anytime you're ready, RJ, we're ready. And, you know, I'm staring at the rod tip. But but the truth be told, when you have success like I had, I, I already know what the, the, the fruit of the weight is. But if you've never caught a swordfish and, and you, you're, you're thinking about electric reels and pushing a button, what kind of fishing is this? And truth be told, a lot of people are uncomfortable drifting slow boating out where they can't really see land. So truth be told, if you were looking to get into it, hire somebody to take you out, figure it out before you start cracking a checkbook for re any type of rod, reel, or even boat. But, you know, it's it's one of those things. It's a special fishery, takes a special kind of person. And most times you either love it or you can't stand it. So charter somebody would be my answer for that question. I love that. I love that. Yeah, it could get a little boring out there. A lot of the times it's a it's a beer. It's a beer sport. You know, me and my buddies. <laughs> yeah, no, I hear you, man. It can be terrible. Oh, yeah. So before fishing, I know you had went to art school, right? You played some minor league baseball, correct? Um, can you tell us about that journey and how you got into the whole uh fishing world and how you had your own shop and the studio and the charters. Can you tell us a little bit about your journey? I got to tell you, that's a crazy, honestly, even for me, I think about it. It's a special story. It's, there's a lot to it. I'll try to give you the cliff notes in the next two hours. Now, let's, so, so really here's the deal. So I, um, I have five brothers and sisters. I grew, I, I was born in South Florida in Fort Lauderdale, been here my whole life. My dad had a furniture business right here in Deerfield. And, uh, and my oldest brother, uh, my, well, my oldest brother, my only brother, Ed, he was uh, he worked on the drift boat out of Hillsborough and at the Hell and S for 15 years. So I grew up around fishing with the party boat. My dad had a sea wind, 28 foot sea wind. And we, we, we always fished when my brother wasn't fishing on the drift boat. So I grew up in that area fishing around guys. And, and, and so, and obviously then it was time when I was young, but when I say fishing, you know, he used to, they'd work three, three trips a day back in the day, morning, afternoon, and, 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 and party boat, drift boat fishing, man, fishing was a way of life for people in South Florida. When I was a kid, it's a lot different today than it was then. Back then they had certain uniforms. They had pressed shirts. They had long pants. You were, if you were out of uniform, man, hit the road, pal. You're not working on the drift boat. Drift boat was an was a, a, honestly a, a high end thing. It was cool to be a drift boat mate. And uh, these guys were good. And I remember having the feeling being around a drift boat mate, you know, my brother's friends being like in awe of the guys who were, you know, working on the drift boat. And so I grew up around that having res ultimate respect for fishing guys like that, you know, and, then, and my brother prior to that was a Big, a lefty pitcher. He was really good, man. So major league prospect, the whole nine yards. But, you know, he, he chose, you know, it was the 70s back then, man. So there was other things going on, too. And long story short, he grew his hair long and went fishing instead of throwing fastballs. You know, lefty, he would still be in the major leagues. But um, I, he got, I was into baseball at a young age. Um, played baseball all the way through. Two sports in high school, basketball, baseball, and Long story short, I, I got a college scholarship. I went to Flagler my freshman year. You know, um, then I, I, I did really well. My sophomore year, I transferred because I wanted to go to a big school. And long story short, my dad got sick, terminal cancer. So I ended up at FAU to finish my last two years because I, I didn't want to travel away from him while he was dying. So um, after my senior year, I, I signed as a free agent with – uh, the Marlins organization, which back then the team was called the Miami Miracle, and they were based out of Pompano, um, played some games. And, you know, baseball was great, man. I was really into baseball. I coached for a few years as well, really into coaching. And we had a lot of success. And, you know, even playing, one of the things that, you know, even now as an adult, you know, in anything that you do, you know, in life, you, you I, I wasn't a student of the game. And you hear that from from a lot of people today who are 
big time coaches and stuff. You know, my brother, my brother had an 85 mile an hour fastball, but he had an unbelievable finesse. So he couldn't overpower anybody. So when my brother pitched, he could remember all the different batters, what they did the last time, how he needed to pitch him. Me, I threw 92, 93, 94. I don't care. I just threw it. And so I, you know, and, and, and until you get to the level where the guys are all that good, you can get by. So I never had to study the game. I was just a power pitcher and I had the tools, but I didn't have the between the ears to be able to take it to the next level. So, you know, it was wonderful to be a part of and to see. And I, I actually got invited back after I let go, got let go by the Marlins organization. I got invited back to go with um, the Dodgers in Vero Beach. And I had in the process prior at my after my dad passed, I was watching the furniture store with my mom and we had this old biker bar on the side called the Ambassador Lounge. And my mom said, you got to help me watch the lounge, you know, and, and I'll, you know, I was a 21, 22 year old kid. What do you mean? I want to watch the lounge. I wasn't a partier, right? But the truth is, I started going over there and watching the, the lounge and one of my buddies, Murph, he says to me, I went, we went to school since first grade, first grade, Pat Murphy says, man, we need to, we need to do a DJ night here, man, and blow this, blow this up. And uh, alternative music was big then, clubs were big. And long story short, man, we, we put flyers out at the beach. We had 600 people standing in line trying to get into this dump. Um, and it was a dump, man. Um, but it was cool, you know what I mean? And then I never went back to baseball. We bought the liquor license from my aunt for 40 grand or something like that. And I you know, financed it from my mom. And over a four year span, we knocked down several walls and we became the who's who of music. And we had some of the best music of all time, man. You know, a lot of huge reggae bands uh, went through there. All the guys that you would know, Yellow Man, some Steel Pulse guys. Um, uh, the Whalers, Bob Marley's band, you know, in, in rock and roll, we had Molly Hatchet and all these bands and an alternative music. Gosh, I mean, Marilyn Manson and all those guys used to hang out in the club every night a lot, you know, watching the other bands play. And there was a lot of, you know, bands were big back then and all the classic spin doctors and just, it was, it was crazy. So it was a four year window of, here I'm a 22 year old kid owning a nightclub. And I and I wasn't a partier. I was an athlete. Not that I didn't drink beers and have a good time, but when we were working, we were working. And, and so, you know, I did that for four years. And and uh, when that was over, um, man, it was like I had just gotten married. I married my high school sweetheart, my my girl, my Lisa B. The name of our boat is Lisa B. But Lisa Ottinger and and uh, we went to Pope, I went to Pope John Paul in Boca, and so. She said, you really need to, we need to change this lifestyle because the lifestyle of me coming home at three or four in the morning and her going to work at six doesn't work. So um, the bar was over. We got out of that business. And then I honestly, it was very difficult for a few years because I wasn't, I was used to making money and doing cool things and being like the king of the local area. And now you got to get a real job. But I really wasn't, I really wasn't, um, I wasn't good enough to be able to walk into another job, wasn't qualified to walk into a money-making job unless it was in a nightclub thing, and I couldn't do that. So I, I started, uh, I, I got my Class A CDL tractor trailers license, and we went and we started doing moves for White Lion Moving and Storage in Boca, working for, with my brother. And, um, you know, we would do moves, man, and just making 11 bucks an hour, just grinding. And, and um, did that for a while, then I bought a pool route from a buddy of mine and built that up in the air. During this whole time, I was fishing a part-time on the side. And I was second mating for a boat called the Concrete Machine. And they were a big Wahoo boat. And, you know, the captain, Captain Bill, was a rough cat, but really cool dude, but hardcore fishing guy. Um, and, and the mate, Corey Burlew, uh, they asked me if I'd like to be the second mate on the boat. I said, oh, yeah. Anyway, long story short, started fishing with these guys, and one thing led to another, and now we're doing tournaments, and then Corey leaves the boat, and I'm the mate on the boat. 
And it never really stopped from there. I was always blessed to be around really good fishing guys. So you said about swordfish, like a lot of the technical stuff. Man, let me tell you, we did so much hardcore fishing for blue marlin, for yellowfins, for cobia, hardcore. And, and this captain saw fish as dollar signs. He didn't care. He was over the catch. It was about the money. So when you fish for money, that changes everything. And so after a four-year stint with that program, with Wahoos, man, I mean, this guy was, we'd go over five days a week. It was the 72 Donzi. We'd go, we'd leave Boca at 5 a.m. We'd be over at the spot at 7. We'd fish till 1. We'd be back in the inlet at 2.30, 3.30. Well, I had to clean the, you know, 72 from the tower down, drop off his money at the bar, be there in the morning at 3.30 to get the rods out again. So do that, when you start to do that kind of level of, stuff it's fun fishing becomes not fun and so it was it was about the money and feeding your family and you know sometimes they say fishing's fun till you have to do it you know um and it's wonderful but it you know for the guys that do it on a daily basis yes so they're wonderful times but man it can be rough as a as a fisherman for a living you know it's tough man but um that's a little bit of it you know as far as how did i get from there to here um from art and tackle. So, you know, I got out of that boat. When I got off that boat, I had kids and I couldn't travel. And I went to the Cove and I started fishing with Captain Mark Danley on the VIP challenge. And Mark was, Mark's my captain on, on the Lisa B now. So I worked for Mark for four years. It seems like I always work with people for four years. So I worked for Mark for four years out of the Cove and we mounted a lot of fish and, you know, we, we had, we got a good tips and it was a great job. And, and when the swordfish boom started, recreational nighttime sword fishing, I was fishing on that boat. And I was I was doing drawings um, in the salon in my downtime, booking charters, waiting for people to walk up. And I'd start doing black and white illustration, which I had done in college, but not to this level. I just loved artwork. You know, I loved to sketch. And, you know, and then all of a sudden I, I didn't have any extra money. But what I when I made enough money to print 12 shirts. I remember doing a, a sailfish drawing, black and white illustration, just a drawing. This guy says, let me make you some shirts, man. You need to sell these shirts. You think I could do that? I said, man, that would be awesome if I could sell the shirts. Now, but the guys knew I drew. And so he made 12 shirts. I'll never forget it, man. I think I had a Ford Aerostar van, old one, beater, man, you know, and uh, he dropped off 12 shirts. And, and I remember looking at the shirt in the back of the van, holding up the shirt and all the mates were on the dock. What about the shirt? I, how much for that one? And I remember I had, I sold 12 shirts in about 20 minutes, you know, for $20 a piece or whatever they were. And I think they maybe they costed me eight. So I made 12 a piece, 12 times 12. I just made $144, man. And off of the artwork that I did in the salon. So then I do another shirt and, and all of a sudden, I was like, once a month, all right, that shipment will be down here. And all the mates would come. And then I'd drive to Hillsborough Inlet. And they would come out and they would buy the shirts. And Hill So I would go from the inlets and then sell my shirts at the art. And then I said to Mark, my, my mom said, you should really, we should really travel this art circuit selling artwork. You got all this artwork. So I remember just, just submitting my drawings and I got accepted to some art stuff. And on the first show I did, I, we did really well. It was like, it was like a dream come true. And I said to Mark, Mark, I think I'm going to stop fishing full time and start doing the art show circuit. When I opened my first store, I made all these framed pieces. And uh, I'll never forget, I, I, I put all the stuff in the store. And my, my goal was, I went, you know what I'll do? I'll give art lessons for a living. So I signed up a couple kids and I started doing art lessons in this little empty bay. And another buddy of mine comes in and says, because I knew all the fishing guys, been fishing my whole, you need to carry tackle in here. I'm like, why would I carry tackle in here? Like, it, wasn't, it was so far from what I was doing. I wanted to do artwork, but maybe I should carry some tackle in here. So I, you know, this a company Highliner down in Pompano. They said, man, we, we've known you forever. We'll give you the stuff if you sell it. Just pay us when you sell it. So I, you know, I opened up a tackle store with four items on the wall like this. There was nothing in the whole store. 
And I was like, all right, I guess I'm started. I'm a tackle store. Come on in, boys. So people would come in and I'd sell one of these. And then the profit, I'd figure out the profit. If I sold one of these, then I could buy two of these. So then I'd, I, would, I would make my money in art. But I reinvested every dollar I made in to build inventory and tackle. And I just kept filling the wall based on sales and investment into the product, into the products and into our brand. So, man, we started with nothing. We didn't have anything. You know, even from the days of the bar, we had, you know, gosh, man, I, I made a lot of money, but pissed it all away. I had four cars. I had, I had, you know, low riders and freaking wagons sponsored by Sound Advice, 12s. And, you know, you couldn't even turn the volume up. But when that was all over, that money was gone. And now I, I really had to start from scratch. So it was a cool way. And we built the tackle business from nothing. Um, and it, man, what a trip it's been, you know. Yeah. Well, you built an empire now. That's kind of, an, that's an insane <laughs> route that you've taken that journey. Yeah, man, for sure. Really, really cool. A lot, a lot to it, right? Absolutely. And I mean, now you're making some music, right? I'm going to tell you, man, right now, <laughs> let me tell you what I got going. No one even really knows what I've been doing on music for about a year right now. So I put, I had for fun, I was doing some rap songs and writing songs and that's a whole story in itself. But I've always been into music. Remember, I owned a club where music was cutting edge. I'd come to, back in the day, so many people wanted to play at this club. I'd have to listen to 50 cassettes or CDs uh, a day to figure out who I wanted to have play at this club. Music was in, kind of in tune with us. We were really hardcore into the different styles. So when it happened, so happened that I, I wrote Bust a Nickel, the song about catching a swordfish in a tournament. Oh, yeah. It was a guy, yeah, which was a cool. Was I a love true that song. song. It's a, honestly a classic, cool story. Yeah. True story. And, you know, um, I knew nothing about finding beats and how that all worked, but I wrote the story. Then I, but I, but musically, I know I can get, with melody and things. I understand tempo, melody, and, and we, you know, I used to run sound, so I started to experiment. Anyway, I put out, I put out maybe five or six songs, right? And about a year ago, I met two guys. They came up to me, and said, "Hey, man, still writing music?" I go, "Man, I, I love writing music." So the guy, well, we love playing music, man. We want to love to play with you, man. And we got a band. We got three guys, and uh, it's funny because we all have. Coke bottle glasses, man. We're classic. We should have called ourselves Coke bottles. But really, I met this Ben and Dan Seffer. They're legally blind brothers. And they're flat out stone cold killer musicians. St steel drum guitar, uh, bass. And, went, and then we got a great drummer named Joe Getz. We've been in the studio for a year recording reggae music. And and uh, so I've been writing reggae music songs for and, and some other ones, some heavier edge tunes, real music. Um, not rage against the machinist, but a little like it's almost like a sublime slash rage against the machine kind of heaviness in one side. And then hard, old school style, cool reggae incorporating a lot of steel drums. So I got some serious music about to, about to blow up. And it's man, I've never and we did our first gig at a, at a private party last weekend. And it was fabulous, man. And um, so we're getting ready to do a gig in the swamp in a couple of months with the airboat guys out there. And we're going to sure. kind of, that's going to be coming out where we, where we show some stuff, but we got a lot in the works and I love music, man. That's my, you know, you know, even from sword fishing, man, if you're sitting there looking at the freaking rod tip, you got to be playing some music, you know? <laughs> oh yeah. You need some tunes going down. Well, I can't no, wait definitely. to hear what you got dropping soon. Um, mm -hmm. I love, I got a question is big mama's true story or is that just for the song? What a great, what a great question. So Big Mama, uh, Big Mama stemmed from stemmed from a true story. No, we didn't let her go at the end. But the truth is, man, that, that that's a story in its own. And I'll never, by far, the biggest fish I've ever hooked in my life out here off the floor anywhere in my life, um, going back several years. And I want to tell you something, man. I, when I relived the experience of fighting this swordfish, well over a thousand pounds. I don't even, I can't even put a number on it because it was, it was fake looking and it wasn't phased after six and a half hours. And 
what the craziest thing about this was it really, you know, when you have a female, big sword, a lot of females are courted by males, okay? And when they spew eggs, a lot of times the males, well, they, that gets them fired up, okay? So this fish we hooked went slack and, and to the surface, and we knew it was a giant fish, but we didn't realize till we got up next to it how, how giant it was. But, but the first time we approached this fish, mirror come. It was off our quarter, and I was just about to go up to get a, and I'll try and get a harpoon shot in the bow. And a, a swordfish comes somersaulting over the bow and almost lands on the wind down, spooks the big fish. The big fish goes out maybe 50 yards and stops, angled down to 250 and stopped. So what the, oh, it was another swordfish. Okay. 10 minutes later, the line went angle up right off the corner. As soon as I'd go to do it, you wouldn't see a swordfish. But as soon as you, all of a sudden there's a sword, another swordfish in the air somersaulting. The most craziest whacked out jump. To, and land almost on the other swordfish to spook it away from what we were doing. This goes on for six hours. The same exact thing. Just and it's not the it. same sword. So the swordfish, but I remember getting a look at the swordfish, and I'm with, the, I'm with the kid who worked at the shop, great mate. His name was Jeff Walls. And Jeff says, so we get a, we finally get a, we get the sun at the right angle and we take a look with the fish we and all of a sudden we can really get a, a look at this fish and i'll never forget it because he was a stone cold killer not afraid we both looked at the fish and he goes he said hunter give me a beer out of there and he goes how are we dealing with that and i remember being like how are we dealing with that that's not 600 that's not 700. I can deal with that. It's not 800. Okay, we can deal with it. This was like, how? I don't even know if we can kill that. Like that, you know what I mean? And we're, we're stone cold killers too. You know, we're, we caught some fish. We, we, we caught a lot of 500s and 600s and a few seven. This was in a different category. This was different. It was different. And, and long story short, after six and a half hours, you know, we ended up losing the fish, but um, long story short, the, the the other there was communication there between the other males and this fish to spook it off of what was happening. There's no question in my mind if you were there and you experienced it. And then one guy says there was an attorney, a guy on the boat, Hunter Craig, great guy, um, good fisherman. Nobody said anything after we lost this fish because we were all just done. And finally, he says, hey, man, can I, talk, can I say something? I said, sure, man, go ahead. He goes, I'm glad it got off, man. I go, what do you mean? He goes, just wouldn't have been right taking that fish with all those other fish with it. And honestly, I felt the same way, man. If you'd have seen it and you saw the other fish with that one the way it was, yeah, no, I, I felt the same way. I, I was like, yeah, no doubt. I don't even know. Now, if we, if the thing would have swam up and those fish weren't there and we could have got lucky with two darts in it, could we have possibly got it even with two darts? Man, I'm going to tell you, it wasn't six or 700. It wasn't that number. So when you see something like a Volkswagen next to the boat, that's there's a difference between a 700-pound fish and one 1,200. That's a different game. So... Big Mama, your original question was started out. I was going to talk about Big Mama, but then I, I couldn't really tell that story of the fish all jumping. People were like, "What is he talking about?" So it kind of turned into what it was. But um, yeah, I've seen some big ones, you know. And uh, oh, yeah, yeah, just be to be able to close the deal on big ones and and do all that. And yeah, you know, I think we have nine over five hundred now, and I'm waiting for number ten. You know, so that's. That's a big number. Oh, yeah. No, 100%. Well, I hope it comes soon. And that's incredible. Big mama. She's a big mama. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, you got one in Puerto Rico. You got the Puerto Rico record, right? 645 pounds. Yeah, we call it big on the first drop, man. 
That was what a fish that was. I'm going to walk over here. I think I'm getting a little better. Stand by. Hold I hear on. you, Cap. Um, yeah, I'm going to get this thing hooked hook up and we'll get back to it. But, you know, I went to, um, this is pretty interesting. A lot of the swords that we paint. Kind of cool. Um, oh, there you go. Let me just plug in. Yeah, man. Yeah, very cool. Let me get plugged in here. We'll be all set. Sure. Stand by. All right. All right. So um, I had traveled to Puerto Rico uh, with Jeff Wilson. Uh, Jeff Wilson is now the captain of Cambo. Um, he was with Tighten Up for years, and then he was with Booby Trap for several years. But we went down there and, and uh, with Paco Vela. And uh, never forget it, man. We, we Paco said, hey, well, let's do a seminar down here in Puerto Rico. I said, no problem, man. So I get Jeff and we get Richie Claudges, a kid that I fish with a lot here. And uh, we go down there and he says, well, we'll go out the day before and, and everything was great. And then the next day we'll do the seminar. I said, wonderful. So we're heading out the inlet and he says, um, well, where do you want to go? I said, where is it? Well, he says, we're here. We're a mile off the beach. I'm looking in my hotel rooms right there. You're like, we're, we're not even, we're not even, you know, a couple miles off the beach. But Jeff Wilson says, man, look at that. And, um, and it was a crater. It was a little crater, a small crater, 2,000 feet at the bottom, 1,800 feet at the rim. And, and, and um, Paco says, well, let's go there. And we said, man, just take us where you've caught one before. No, we're going there. Anyway, we go there and we take a drop. And, you know, kind of a primitive style of a drop, a breakaway. And, um, so we dropped down and it's kind of rough. It was four to six foot. And, you know, we have a Pepsi bottle that's got red and white tape on it. Like, and I'm watching the whole thing go down and they put the, the rod out and you can barely see the bottle. And I'm thinking in my mind, how am I going to see a bite on that thing, right? He goes, oh, you're thinking you're not going to see the bite on that thing. I'm like, yeah, kind of. And he goes, oh, you'll see it. Just keep an eye on it. <laughs> a couple minutes go by and, um, he, um, I look at the jug and it looks a little funny. And so I look at the jug, I look at him, he goes, you see it? I go, yep. Anyway, I said, it was just a little lighter than it should have been. And long story short, he goes, all right, he hooks this fish. Well, he hooks the fish and, and it comes to the surface. And I said, well, maybe we should get a harpoon ready. And I said, well, yeah, we don't have anything. We don't have any harpoons. Okay, how about a gaff? Yeah, we really don't have any gas. The fish jumps next to the boat. And we're like, oh, okay. Well, we don't really have anything. Well, this should be interesting. So, but long story short, I was in Puerto Rico. It wasn't like I was going to sell the fish or do something with it. So when the fish jumped, we all knew it was a big fish. We couldn't tell how big. And this fish took a run on the surface. I got to tell you, it probably went 300, 300 legitimate football yards and stopped and swam back slack by the boat and went 300 yards the other way, full speed. I said, back it off. And we we dragged the drag off and we had um, no drag on the fish, letting them burn it up. So it was, I said, when this fish stops, just push the drag up, it's done. And we he went that way, he went this way, he stopped, we wound him to the boat, hex up and it was over him. And I think we, we pulled him into the boat with a, uh, uh what clean brush or something trying to get him in the trying to get him through the door it was the classic it was the first drop we were back at the dock at 10 o'clock in the morning we got drunk we i think at 11 o'clock we figured somebody stole the fish or something it was gone we didn't even know where it was and we were so freaking happy man and it was 6 45 i think something like that but That's the biggest crazy. one that they've caught there but think about that that was gosh is that four or five years ago six and they haven't caught one over that size yet since that day. That's, wow. you know, so some things are meant to be gifts from God, man. You know, so it's, it's Absolutely. really, cool, we're blessed. Dude. Yeah. No, 100%, no, that's definitely a blessing. Absolutely. I mean, 
being able to get a fish of that size and then also it be a record is absolutely insane. You know, so recently you were, you have a blog, right? Or you have, you put out reports every week and you're saying that the uh, sword do, bite's I'm... about to get hot, right? Well, it is, you know, you, historically, this is a great month for sword. I mean, today there was a 401 caught in Palm Beach today. There was a, 337 caught out of Hillsboro yesterday. There's some big fish around and they're kind of spread out a little bit right now. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, this is a time where you start to see some mules, some big ones come through. Um, consistent time. You know, we fished the other day. We caught two on uh, two drops. You know, yeah. So, you know, we keep log books, man. I can tell you what I was doing today 25 years ago. So I have every so, but in the old school, like everyone, my wife always says, man, put the stuff in your phone. I said, hell no, I'm writing everything I do down and I can go back and I have 25 years of books that I can tell you where I caught a swordfish 25 years ago today. So when you look at all that stuff and keep good log books on what you, and we, man, I'm going to tell you, guy says to me, you know, you guys are really consistent. When you keep good records of what you do, not just on catches, on skunks. Keep records on skunk trips because you learn more when you don't catch anything than you do sometimes when you do. So, man, we had a thing called the Sword Southeast Swordfish Club, and we were the only reporting agency for NOAA at the time, and we were set up as a tournament. So every 30 days, we had over 100 guys reporting, and I created this page where you'd go in, not myself and Jeff Anderson and Skip Smith. Um, and we, we created this outline of questions. What was the moon face? What color light stick did you use? What was in his stomach? How deep was the bite? What was the wind doing? Was anybody else on the radio? Did you get, but you, in order to be part of the club, you had to fill out the catch sheet within 24 hours. Man, we learned so much about doing this back then because, man, we didn't have the money to burn to go do this kind of fishing and the fuel and what it was taking. So it was like, man, if you were going tomorrow night, I'm like, and you wanted to know what I caught, I had to report. So if I didn't report, you'd get pissed. So it was a great way of being able to report and learn, you know, what we were catching and how to keep log books. And so today, I mean, you could almost go to some of the guys that are good and look at their Instagram pages at the same month last year and then the same month year before that, were they catching them or not catching them? I mean, it's kind of a dead giveaway sometimes. The only, the only thing I will tell you is, is that the, the, there's a historical migration, which runs, you know, in November, December, you'll see some big fish. But the truth is, man, like we've satellite tagged more swordfish. We have, we, I've been a part of more than all, anybody. Um, a satellite tag. And now with the, you know, we did a Tony DeJulian who works for Pelagic put a trip together where we went out and put out last two years ago, almost two years ago, put out these shark tags. Now these shark tags are, there's no time limit. It's not like a 120 day tag. So these, you can go on O search right now and you can search the swords that we tagged here a wow. couple of years ago and see what, and it's so crazy because you don't, there's no real rhyme or reason. There's not enough information about swordfish. You can you can tag five swords in one spot, and a, and, and a month later, one's in the Caymans, one's off North Carolina, and the other one's in the Bahamas. This one, the, so it, it really, in our lifetime, man, we don't we really don't know enough about these things, man. It's and I think that's the draw for me. There's two things. One, I. It's the size. I, I feel like, you know, you see that line angling up and it's going to jump and you don't know if it's 60 pounds or 1260. That to me means that bill starts coming out. So that that ability to catch a freaking donkey, that's what I'm going for. Whether that's a sword, a marlin, you, met, you know, a tuna, you know, you mentioned the chair in, in Nova Scotia. Um, oh, yeah. Right? Yes, sir. <laughs> What's going on with that? I got to <laughs> that share but we broke it you know to give y'all an idea we fought a fish man andy moyes i was with fishing with andy moyes and and uh we we hooked a tuna man and it was monstrous and you know using andy's tackle a lot of his was 130s and 
man, like a meat stick. Like you couldn't bend the rod if you wanted to type of a rod. And we hook a fish, man, we can't catch this fish. He can't get a wrap on this fish. And it was, it was getting, it was at 110 pounds at sunset on a, on a 130 international push and drag to the limit. So if you look at a 130, if you drag skate, you know, 130 at sunset, we were at 55 at strike, I want to say. And we were at 100, 110 pounds at full sunset. And I told Andy, man, we're going to catch this thing and I'm going to put it on him. And I was at, I was in the chair standing straight up over the reel, obviously. I had, to, I had 110 pounds of pressure and uh, he couldn't get a wrap. There was too much tension and the fish wouldn't give. He was digging and digging and digging, you know, and even with a back wrap, a lot of times you can get from the rod, you pull from the back side of the rod to get a wrap. There was too much tension to even to get a back wrap on this fish. Long story short, just before I, my legs were giving out, I said, I'm almost done, dude. I'm almost done. I can't hold it. I'm going to have to back it off. All of a sudden, the footrest cracked off the chair forward. And I fell forward. When I fell forward, he got a wrap on the fish. And we ended up catching this fish. And, it, you know, and, you know, we don't know if it's, it was 1250 or 14. We don't know how. Like, but that's the biggest one. He's got. He, that's what he does. These guys are tuna guys. They catch giant shit. And he, and, and, <laughs> When you saw that fish, I mean, the peck fin was that big. It was giant. It was freaking fat, just a butterball. Had been eating herring for months. It was the right one. It was giant. Now, up there, if you don't have a tag, you can't take one. Um, and over the years that I fished up there, I think we took two or three. And, um, and it was a specialized fish, six to 800 in that area. So we took a couple. But, the you know, the, the fish that you catch in Nova Scotia, they're all five to 700 an occasional bait you know that 800 900 but man i gotta tell you dude testing tackle and understanding wind downs and understanding failure when you deal with giant fish you do they will find the weak link on your stuff that's what we love and that's when we're dissecting tackle not just for swords for freaking wahoos i mean my charter boat we catch more those guys we, we love we crush the wahoos man and you I'm know sure. and the art of it you know the art of being the best at it we want to be the best at what we do you know whether that's tackle whether that's you know any of it so yeah man true passion in a lot of areas dude and, and uh exciting as hell of course of course i know you're super passionate about it all and you're super passionate about fishing and everything but i know you also love to give back to the community right you got mission fishing right if there's one thing, you know, you people say, you know, and as as men, right, as as guys in this life, you know, you you go through and you do things. And there was a time in my life, and I remember that clearly when I was traveling a lot and fishing, and I remember being so self-centered about what I was doing, you know. Oh, we're, well, we're going to go to Venezuela, then we're going to fly to Cape Verde. Oh, we're going to fly. No, let's fly to Australia. We'll, we'll fish for Black Marlin. Then we'll go to Nova Scotia. Then I'm going to come back and we're going to fish. But it was like, man, here I am living this life, this these gifts that are given to me. And I've always, I, I mean, listen, man. I, I, but I, I, was, I was self-centered and saturated in what I was doing. And got to a point without going into a long story where it was, you know, it was, I was disappointed in myself uh, for who I was, how I was conducting myself as a man doing stupid crap. Um, and, you know, man, you know, and it was a real wake up call for me. Um, and I needed to change my life and the way I was doing things, man. And uh, not being the best husband, not being the best father to my kids, doing making decisions that were stupid, and and, and really, man, it, it hit me like a ton of bricks. Um, and you know, I had a I had a, a friend of mine, man, growing up. His name was George Liddy. He had uh, cerebral palsy. Anyway, one of the greatest guys, you know. But my family was always involved around special needs. Um, so 
and my dad had a special place in his heart for that. So we, through the Rotary Club or different things, we were always, my dad was always giving back and we were around it. But when I, when I finally, you know, tried to figure out that I needed to grow up um, and, and take responsibility for my actions and be a better man and do things. And, you know, it's not about the fishing, dude. You know, the gifts that were given that I've been given, and, 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 you know, and I was a taker, man. I'm a taker. I'm taking all these gifts, but I'm not really giving it to, I'm, I'm not giving it back. And, and I, you know, you start to learn, you know, we have a Bible study every Tuesday night. And I remember just getting to a point, my cousin's a pastor, man. And he said, man, we need to have a Bible study at your shop, man. And, and I remember just being like a deer in the headlights. And I went to, listen, I was an altar boy till I was 15. I went to Catholic school and all that stuff, but man, that wasn't that I, I wasn't focused there, man. I wasn't, and, and so I'm not a religious guy. I'm a Christian guy. I'm a Bible guy. I, I spend time in the Word. I, I'm, I'm working on changing my life on a daily basis, and you know the, the mission fishing, the mission fishing thing that we're talking about, the the kids program or the siblings program. We've been doing now for let's say nine years or so. You know, this year we'll have 14 outings. So once a month plus this Saturday, I'll, I'll, we have eight or nine new families that'll come out, eight or nine new boats, all volunteers. We put families on boats and they have a, they have a half a day, four or five hours to themselves to go out. And, you know, sometimes we fish, sometimes we ride, sometimes I'll put the boat on autopilot and he'll drive and try to turn the wheel, but it's not really doing anything because they just want the experience. So I've learned so much about it. So myself and Tony Davis, um, and Fred Gush, who started this years ago, and we put this together. And, and uh, man, it's freaking crazy. And, you know, they say you can't get to heaven through works, okay? Because you can't earn that. But what happens is when you when you have faith, right? When you have faith in God, you believe that Jesus and God, and you believe that that's real. When you have faith, works become a byproduct of faith. You feel like that's part of what you do, man. You know, just because you're so thankful for what you're given and what you've been given and what you have. So people, you know, and so that's why I always say I, I feel compelled to have to give back because I was such a skunk for so long. And I'm just trying to do the right thing, man. And, you know, I'm not, listen, man, I'm far from it, but trying to do my part. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. But I'm sure the Lord is blessing you back. You know, you're doing the <laughs> Lord's work. You're doing the right thing. So... <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. And I, and I, like I said, works is a byproduct of faith, and I'm a believer, man. I'm a Christian, die hard, and, and so yeah, I'm in it, man. Same here, man. Absolutely. Well, Cap. On that note, I really appreciate you. God bless you, Cap. Thank you for everything. I got one quick request, and you can totally say no. But we want to hear a rap from you. Can you drop? Can you drop something for us? <laughs> I'm gonna tell you. I, I'm gonna. I don't know how we're going to do this, but I need to get to some of this fresh song. So this one I just wrote last night, a little while ago, it's called One Drop. It's a reggae tune. And it's called, uh, and, and, I, and it, every time I go to my, make a drop, there's somebody sitting on my spot. So it goes, I went down to my fishing hole this morning and saw a man sitting on my spot. I said, hey man, do I know you? He said, no, but I fish here a lot. One drop, I've got to make just one drop, whoa. And it goes on to the second spot and the third spot, and it says, I went down to my last spot this morning, and nobody was sitting on that spot. My father took me there when I was a young boy. He taught me how to tie my first knot. And then it, it, it talks about, long story short, we get skunked and go home with no fish. But it's called One Drop, and it's a reggae tune. It's coming out soon. We got another one called Mrs. Blue that's really, really good, and uh, and another one called Mr. Rasta Man. But we'll, we'll, keep, we'll give you that for tonight, man, and, and uh, look forward to some of that music. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Cap. That was awesome. All right. <laughs> All right. See you, dude. Later. Thanks for joining us on The Science of Fishing. We hope that this was helpful and you learned something for the next time you're wetting a line. Follow us on Instagram at Science of Fishing and make sure you subscribe to stay up to date on future episodes and share this with someone you know. 
until next time.